those of you who know what the philanthropy roundtable is will appreciate uh, being able to hear from their director of publications, Carl Zinsmeister. It's my pleasure to introduce him. Um, Carl and I have something in common. We overlapped in the Bush administration. He was on the domestic policy side and I was on the foreign policy side, but I like to think what we both had in common was the liberty of the individual was the most important factor in animating our work and philanthropy, uh, philanthropy plays a big role there. Some of you may know just the other day we had a, uh, a, a lecture here by a, an expert on Alexis de Tocqueville and we're going to have another one later in the spring and in the middle is Carl Zinsmeister and this is all relevant because Alexis de Tocqueville, those of you who know this French scholar, believed that the philanthropy, the charity, the voluntary organizations uh, that animated the early colonies and the early country were key to making it a successful, prosperous, stable republic and uh, believed also predicted that as long as that was something that animated the republic, the republic could be strong and secure and that when that was weakened either because donors don't want to do for other people or donors cannot do for other people because of restrictions on their wealth and ability to create it, the republic would be in trouble. Um, so that is why it is so important to act an institute. It's one of the pillars uh, in, in our teaching and in our uh, expression of our ideals is that philanthropy, the right of people to produce wealth and then to use it as they see fit in freedom makes for a strong country. Carl has been focused on these things for many years. He's been at the Philanthropy Roundtable for five years uh, as director of publications, all the publications, web publishing, magazines, and books. And uh, a lot of that work is now culminated in a 1,300-page compendium of the great donors and the great stories behind that, which is there on that table over there, and Carl's going to talk about that. The whole point is to study in this compendium and to record people who solve public problems with private resources. Think of that phrase, solving public problems with private resources. Honey on the lips, is it not? It's a wonderful phrase, and it sort of encapsulates, encapsulates exactly what philanthropy is all about. Uh, Carl has authored 11 books, uh, and here's where we get into the Renaissance man aspect of him. Two of those books, embedded as a reporter in the Iraq War. He's written a book on charter schools, a storytelling cookbook, and he has published a graphic novel uh, with Marvel Comics. He's made a PBS feature film and written hundreds of articles for publications like The Atlantic, Wall Street Journal, and others. Earlier in his career, and this is where he gets even more interesting. If it's some of this may be made up, Carl, I'm not sure, but <laughs> he worked uh, when he was younger for Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And whether you're left or right, conservative, uh, liberal, Republican, or Democrat, um, and you love freedom, there's a lot about Senator Moynihan's life to respect. If you want to know uh, what's wrong with the United Nations, you ask. Uh, you could ask Senator Moynihan. If you wanted to know what was the root cause of poverty in America. You could ask Senator Moynihan. If you wanted to know how to drink half a bottle of scotch and quote Shakespeare flawlessly, <laughs> you ask Senator Moynihan. He could do all those things. Carl has, um, uh, was before that 13 years with uh, American Enterprise Institute and editor of their magazine. And as I said, most recently before coming to um, Philanthropy Roundtable was with uh, the Bush White House. Please join me in welcoming Carl Zinsbein. Thank you. That was a pleasure. Thank you for that lovely introduction. The short version of that is that my mom says I can't hold a job. So, <laughs> you know, that's, she, what, that was a polite phrase. He said renaissance or something, but it's, that, that, now you know the truth. Um, I am uh, so happy to, to be in this city, which I'm sure, you know, you're too close probably. You don't appreciate some of these aspects, but I mean, this, this, this is one of those cities where the two things that really built our country, which are business and philanthropy, are both practiced at a just absolutely top shelf level, really unusual and really, um, really exciting. You know, my view when I was walking around the city today was, we need about a thousand more Grand Rapids. <laughs> and of course, we want a branch of Acton in every one of them, so get to work, go, 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 go to it. Um, I'm gonna talk about philanthropy tonight, and you know, that has the disadvantage of being one of those, you know, big Latinate words that sounds kind of scary and it's a little fuzzy. My, in fact, I have a 90-year-old mom and about every six months, she calls me up and she says, now, Carl, 
tell me again, this, this philanthropy thing, is that like Plato and Socrates or is that stamp collecting? I can never remember, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, it's just, it's, it's not a really easy kind of phrase that flows off your lips, but it's tremendously important. And I'm here to hopefully de demystify it a little bit for you and to, 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 to really give you a sense of its true import. I mean, nobody's against private giving or charity. All right, that's lovely. Everyone's in favor of that. But I think the conventional view is that it's kind of like, a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice coat of paint on the American mansion. Just little, this is a sweet little thing that we do. Actually, that's completely wrong. In fact, philanthropy is really part of our foundation, our, 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 our structure, the, the whole substance of our nation. And we would be a very, very different country if we did not have this remarkable philanthropy I'm going to describe to you tonight. So let me um, try to convince you on that front by starting with some brute numbers. This is the, uh, I don't know if you realize this, 11% of all workers in the whole country are working in the, uh, in the charitable sector today. As a fraction of, of GDP last year, it was about 6%. I know that sounds like gobbledygook to a lot of people, but trust me, that's a big number. To give you a little perspective here, the so-called military industrial complex, you know, you hear about that a lot as a kind of a shorthand for formidable industry. Well, the nonprofit sector passed the military, military defense uh, sector in size way back in 1993 and continues to grow. So this is a big deal economically. It's a big deal uh, culturally and socially. And by the way, this GDP number does not include a penny of value for our volunteer labor. And the estimates are that if you put a reasonable dollar figure on the value of the labor that we volunteer every day, it would roughly double our, our, our annual uh, donations. The donations in cash are about, um, what are they, the latest year, about $370 billion. And you can add about that much more if you were to do a, a reasonable extrapolation of the value of the volunteer time, which is not included here. But uh, anyway, I don't think you hear these kinds of figures very often. You, most Americans are not aware. They don't hear it in the political discourse. They don't s get it in academic uh, discussions. You don't hear it uh, in daily life. And as a result, I think there's an underappreciation of the significance and the consequences of, 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 philanthrop of philanthropy. So we at the, at the round table, the philanthropy round table where I work, decided to do something about that. And we launched a three-year effort to produce this book, The Almanac of American Philanthropy. And basically, this book is built around the three greats, all right? It it's focuses on the great donors and the great accomplishments of philanthropy over the years, li over literally 300 years of American history, and the great ideas and what they are and what they mean. Uh, and the book, I think, really feels, fills some gaping holes in our, you know, our, our, our understanding of ourselves, of our, of our national self-awareness. And I know it probably sounds a little bit like an encyclopedia, and it kind of is, but it, trust me, it's, it, it will not, um, it will not um, bore you, mostly because it's just packed with some really wonderful uh, real-life examples. Some of them are quite local and, and will strike close to home. Here, for example, are some of the entries on Grand Rapids, the Meyer Gardens, the, uh, the Art Prize, and the, uh, the Aviation School, the, uh, what do they call it, the Western Michigan Aviation Academy. Fascinating uh, school you have here. And there's others like this. Um, and, I, and as I say, I absolutely promise the book will not make you snooze because there's just so much Americana in it. And uh, most of all, there's, there's these characters. There's the human drama of really fascinating human beings like this guy. This is Ned McElhaney. And he was born and raised on a Louisiana bayou. And I know I'm looking at your eyes and you're all staring at this guy and saying, that's not a Louisiana. <laughs> but uh, not even at Mardi Gras do they dress like this, right? <laughs> but. Uh, he had this tremendous Forrest Gump life, and he just had all these different episodes and phases. And there was a period where he was up in Alaska doing some Arctic exploring and animal collecting and saved a bunch of sailors that got frozen in on the ice. Remarkable things. He just had one of those lives. Uh, when he returned home, he wrote a book on alligators that's still kind of an authority. He, uh, he wrote another book on wild turkeys. He, he was an ornithologist that is uh, thought to have personally banded about a quarter of a million birds. Just had all kinds of interests and appetites and capacities. Here he is all grown up. I don't know about you, but I get kind of sad when I look at this picture. You know, th this is what happens to men. They start off in furs, and then they put on the bow tie, and, and, and he's paying for life insurance now, and you know, he's doing all the resp responsible things you have to do when you get to be old. Because it, he, Ned McElhaney also had a day job, a very important day job, actually, which was manufacturing and selling the hot pepper condiment invented by his family. Now, we're in Michigan, not in you know, Missouri, so you may not have sh sprinkled this on your scrambled eggs this morning, but a lot of people do. And there is big money in burning people's tongues. <laughs> and I can tell you, because M McElhaney was very successful, and he used his profits for an amazing array of good works. 
For one thing, he got very attached to this fellow native of the bayou. This, this is a Louisiana bird called the snowy egret. Now, when McElhaney was a, uh, a, a young man, there was a fashion craze. I've tried to figure out what the analogy is today. I don't know enough about fashion, but trust me, it was just a mania for, for ladies' hats with plumes of these birds, egret plumes on them. And you look at one like this and you say, okay, I kind of get that. That's pretty fetching. Um, I can see why people might go crazy for that, but trust me, there's lots of other versions that are less fetching. <laughs> so, and you know, this is obviously a silly fashion, but it had a really unsilly effect, which was it was making the snowy egret almost extinct. They were practically hunted out of existence. And when McElhaney figured this out, the, uh, the philanthropist inside of him just kind of sprung into action. And I want you to note, I mean, he, didn't, you know, he didn't call up the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He didn't dial 911. He didn't complain to the governor. He took action. He decided that he would be able to do something about this. So first thing he did, his family owned an island in, um, in Louisiana, still owns an island in Louisiana. And so he went out on his family island, and he literally beat the bushes, and he found eight baby egrets. It took him two days to find. There's very few left, but he found some of these baby egrets, and he literally stuffed them in the pockets of his hunting coat, brought them back, and he uh, set them up in a protected area on his own land and had them cared for over a period of years. And by 1911, he had built up a population of about 100,000 egrets on his private refuge. Same time he was doing that, he recruited some of his philanthropist friends, who included little folks like John Rockefeller and Olivia Sage and others. He convinced them to buy swampy wasteland along the Louisiana coast which was thought to be wasteland, but was actually very important as breeding habitat for the egret and lots of other birds. And in the process of this kind of micro and macro work, he was able to rescue a just really magnificent creature that was about to disappear from Earth. So that's kind of a little taste of McElhaney, but the, one of the episodes that I found out about him later in life just kind of resonated with me because it was also about extinction. Uh, but it was a very different kind of extinction. I told you he was a southern boy, all right? So he grew up with Negro spirituals in his ears, and he loved this music, just really loved this, those songs. And best I can tell, it was around his 60th birthday, he realized he wasn't hearing them anymore. And he'd go to people's houses, and they didn't know the lyrics. They didn't know the words. They couldn't sing them. And it, this alarmed him. You have to realize these songs existed in an oral tradition, all right? They had never been written down. These had been passed from father to son and mother to daughter through generations of slaves and then, and then free African Americans and uh, had, uh, as I say, really been a part of that history that was in the process of disappearing. So he again sprang into action and he again used both his checkbook and his personal involvement. The first thing he did, a lot of philanthropy is local. You know, people care about what's happening in their own area. So he, he looked, he, in this case he beat the bushes again in his local area and he found these two elderly women who still remembered a lot of those old spirituals. And so McElhaney hired a musicologist, and he invited these two ladies to come over to his home, and he just asked them to sing their hearts out. And the two men madly wrote down, as fast as they could uh, scribe it out, all of the lyrics and the melodies and the harmonies, and, he, and they captured this really uh, historic American music in scrupulous detail, exactly as it had been passed down through generations of slaves. And then he published all of this work as a book, which became a classic. There are 125 spirituals in this book. And I actually went to some trouble to try to figure out how many of them were captured in some other place, had been recorded elsewhere, and you know, would have probably been saved regardless. And it, it, as best I can tell, it's about five or six. So the rest owe their existence and the fact that we know them today to the fact that he, he, he took the trouble to kind of to, to save this, uh, this history. And by the way, the songs that he kept alive included the one that Martin Luther King Jr. quoted in his very famous passage. Remember when he talked about free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I free at last. That is a McElhaney spiritual that was, that was saved. So, you know, what a tragedy. Really a tragedy would have been to lose really more than just music. These, these are artifacts of American society, American history and culture. And thanks to his work, they live on. Another red-blooded American philanthropist who helped uh, I guess you could say he helped keep his fellow citizens lastingly free, was this guy. This is Alfred Loomis, which is a name I'll be shocked if any of you know, but you are about to learn what I learned when I started researching him, which is that it's, it's a tragedy, really, and a, and, a, and a travesty that this is not a name more familiar to Americans. He, um, 
he loved science. One of these guys, he just had science in his blood. And from when he was knee high to a grasshopper, just started doing science experiments. Uh, but his father died when he was a young man, and he decided he needed to be able to support the family. So he became a lawyer. He hated that and wanted to get away from it, wanted to go back to science, but realized that to do science at the level he aspired to, he, would, he needed an, an, independent, an independent fortune. So to make a very long story short that I have to compress here, but it, it's in the book, really in fascinating detail. He and his, his uh, brother-in-law went into business uh, in, on Wall Street as financiers, and basically they, they financed about half of the rural electrification of America. It was a big deal in its day. That was the internet boom of its day. And um, he became a very wealthy man in the process. He underwrote the bonds. And then just showed unbelievable, brilliant foresight in anticipating the 1929 um, stock market meltdown. Went completely to cash about three months before the meltdown. Had a boatload of cash. Bought like crazy as soon as it crashed. And by the early 1930s, he was one of the richest men in America. At that point, he retired from finance completely. Just gave it up walked away and poured himself into his science. So almost all of his time and most of his money went into science. He literally bought an old mansion in the neighborhood where he lived in suburban New York City and converted it into a science lab. And it was a state-of-the-art lab, better than anything almost any university in the country had. And McElhaney was not a dabbler. He was a very serious scientist himself and did, for instance, some um, very interesting work on uh, precise measurement of time. That was one of his specialties. Uh, wave theory. Uh, he was one of the first guys that identified uh, brain waves uh, and categorized them and uh, invited a lot of European and American scientists to come work in his lab. And um, anyway, really just an amazing human being. And then in 1938, Alfred Loomis visited Berlin. And he was really struck by two things. He was amazed how popular Hitler was. And he was really struck by how good the German scientists were. And he was very sobered and came home convinced that war was brewing and that science was going to have a lot to do with who won the war. So he just completely poured himself and his money, his own private money, into scientific applications that might have military use. Really gave this some thought. And quickly settled on a very new field that was just beginning to open up uh, using radio waves to detect moving objects what we now call radar. It didn't even exist as a field at that point. And Loomis not only did some of the most important basic science to figure this out in the early days, but then actually started overseeing the production of thousands and thousands of practical working radar sets that were installed in airplanes and ships and uh, land installations and really turned the tide of World War II. I don't know if you know, how, folks, how serious the U-boat threat was or how, you know, what would have happened in the Battle of Britain if there weren't you know, radars available to the Allies. Really a huge contribution. And the fascinating thing, m even more than the money that he put into this, what his huge contribution was his method, his philanthropic method. It's interesting. He had worked in a government ar uh, defense lab in World War I as a younger man. I forget. I think it was Aberdeen. And he just was shocked. He couldn't believe how risk averse they were and how s bureaucratic and sluggish and just kind of and literally, in, in, even in World War II, he, he would talk to people in Washington. And they'd say, oh, yeah, we know, about, um, we know about atomic weapons. We know about radar. That's for the next war. And he said, no, it's not. We have to get it for this war. He said, the Japanese and the Germans are on it, and they will beat us to it, and we will lose this war. So thank goodness he, um, he had this kind of doggedness and this foresight, and he was able to do it with his own just strength of will and, and private money. It's kind of shocking. I know that this is very unfamiliar territory for philanthropy. You think of national defense as the ultimate government responsibility, but... Folks, let me tell you, this is how it happened. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt um, at one point said that there was no civilian in the whole world who had more to do with winning World War II, other than Winston Churchill, than Alfred Loomis. So it's kind of stunning to me that I just discovered this man several years ago and kind of felt stupid that my whole life I had not realized this amazing tale. But that's kind of the second-class treatment that a lot of philanthropy has gotten in our history books, alas. Oh, by the way, here's the cherry on top. So I'm really struck by this entrepreneurial philanthropic method that this guy uses. It's really taught us a lot that's still current today about how you do crash research without getting bogged down in bureaucracy. Again, I can't get into the details here, but it's, it's in the book. He had very specific ideas about how one does that. But the really cool thing was not only do, do we have this, this method that he taught us, but he left behind a flesh and blood embodiment of his whirlwind entrepreneurial style. 
This is his great-grandson. Anybody recognize that face? That is Reed Hastings, who is the founder of Netflix, which by my count has completely turned upside down three separate industries, one after another, and just a brilliant businessman. And in addition, like his grandpa, or great-grandpa, is, uh, is also a very profound philanthropist. He is one of the leading um, creators of charter schools in America. Another very entrepreneurial philanthropist who put deep imprints on America was this man. That is, East, that is George Eastman, who was the man who really popularized photography in the world. Um, when he began making photographs and building a photographic company in the early 1900s, the whole pho photographic process was this giant black box. Nobody really knew how it worked. It was kind of magic. And just to give you an example, there was a very crucial moment early in the life of Kodak when for about a two or three week period, all of the photographs coming back were turning out black, just inexplicably. And you can imagine how popular that was with people. This would have killed the company in very short order if they didn't solve it, figure out what was going on. And they had no idea. It turned out after a lot of frantic, you know, kind of lab work, that the industrial gelatin that is used to coat film, I don't know if you know where gelatin comes from, but it's boiled down cow carcasses is where gelatin comes from. And the cows whose carcasses were being used for this had been moved to new pastures. And the grass they ate in this new foraging era had a little bit less elemental sulfur. And it sounds crazy, but that was enough to just completely screw up the chemistry of, of photography. When they finally figured this out, Eastman said, no more. I'm never going to be a prisoner of that kind of capricious fate. I'm going to figure out the basic chemistry so I, 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 can, I can actually have control of this. So he started hiring chemists. Excuse me, I'm sorry. He started hiring chemists, and um, he went to an obscure little commuter school, actually, in, uh, in Massachusetts called Boston Tech. And he had very good luck. He hired some good people out of Boston Tech. And in appreciation for this, as a philanthropist, later funded most of the transformation of Boston Tech into today's MIT. He, um, he built the entire campus. The, the whole MIT campus was designed and built and laid out by Eastman. This is their library, which he produced. Um, Eastman is, to a very large degree, responsible for the emergence of MIT as one of the world's really great research universities. Now, one of the things you're going to hear about tonight from me is, pa is about passion. Um, passion plays a huge role in philanthropy, and smart people don't get in the way. You know, I don't care if the donor wants to, wants to save a thousand cats in their basement. If they got passion about it, and if they're serious about doing it well, help them. You know, that's what drives excellence. That's what, that's what produces really good results, is to let people uh, do what they care about, what they love, what they, what they feel is important, and to make them good at it. And one of Eastman's passions, he had lots, one of those McElhaney type guys, but one of his passions was music, really a deep interest of his. To give you an example, he had a full-size pipe organ installed in his home, and he hired a guy to come over every morning and play toccatas and fugues as his alarm clock. That's how, that's how he woke up. So uh, I'm going up to his house next week. I can't wait to, to <laughs> poke around. I may steal a few things. He's a huge hero of mine. But um, there's some great stuff in there in there uh, in, in the journals of Eastman and his friends. There's one tale I, I, I was I just chuckled. He, he, it was a woman who went to New York City with him to, on a kind of a music expedition, and they took in 12 operas in six days. And by the way, they, they did a ton of other stuff too. They went to all these museums and everything. And there's one little margin note in Eastman's journal. He says, "And the rest of the time we loafed." <laughs> you wonder where these guys get their energy. But uh, anyway, this, this woman, her, her, her characterization of Eastman was, she said, uh, George is absolutely alcoholic about music. It was perfect, I thought. Anyway, this passion for music was not just trivial. It was not just a kind of a, uh, you know, an ephemeral thing. It led Eastman to one of the great cultural gifts in American history. He, he methodically created and built to world prominence the Eastman School of Music at the University of Rochester. I don't know if you know much about the Eastman School. It's very, very important in changing classical music. It, it Americanized classical music. I mean, until that time, if you wanted to be a conductor or a concert master, you really had to go to Europe. There was no way to get trained here. That changed when he got this place going. And the other thing it did is it popularized classical music. He was very adamant that the tickets would be inexpensive and that the environment would be unintimidating and that this should be something that welcomed all kinds of people. Um, by the way, the other interesting thing that happened in this auditorium, this is the main auditorium of the Eastman School. Obviously, Codex in the film business, Eastman was very interested in movies, the early, the early movies. And it was in this auditorium that we first got our glimmer of a glimpse that 
that movies could be more than just cheap entertainment. Up until then, movies were really kind of disreputable, actually, kind of considered really cheesy, vulgar entertainment. And it was here where we began to see that actually they have potential possibly as an art form in the right hands. And that was, again, <coughs> something that Eastman personally drove. And of course, today the Eastman School remains one of our top cultural institutions 100 years later. Now, the Ford Foundation, I love this quote. I found a quote that, that described the Ford Foundation as, quote, a large body of money completely surrounded by people who want some. <laughs> and you know, you look, at, you look at a big pile of silver like the Ford Foundation, or like some of these individual donors that I've just been describing, and you think, well, that's, that's American philanthropy, isn't it? Actually, no, it's not. I mean, it's part of American philanthropy, but American philanthropy is not primarily a tale of, of moguls and even less is it a, is it a, is it a tale of, of foundations and institutions. <clears throat> the um, perhaps unappreciated fact is, which I'm going to show you right here, is that foundations only give away 14% of the money that gets, that gets donated to charity in a given year. And corporations only give, a, give away another 5%. So the institutional part is actually pretty small. The rest is given by individuals. And the lion's share of that, by the way, is by very average middle American families that give away about $2,500 per household per year. May not sound like a lot, but you multiply that by 100, 150 million households and you get big, big dollars. And that is really the, the iceberg underneath the tip of American philanthropy. So I really want to make clear in the almanac of American philanthropy, not have this point get lost. So I do some extended storytelling about small donors, uh, which I'll introduce a few of, to you here. This is Gus and Marie Selensky. I know it's a terrible photo, but this is the only one I could find. Gus was a plumber, <coughs> and Maria was a nurse. Marie, excuse me, was a nurse. And they lived quietly in a little house in Syracuse, New York, until quite recently. And they were very hardworking and, and quiet people who saved a lot of money. Their one wild indulgence was square dancing. You can see, I think they're in their square dancing rig here. <laughs> and Saturday nights, they probably kicked up their heels. But other than that, they were pretty studious people. And when uh, Gus and Marie died, they left $3 million behind for good causes. Another um, uh, impressive saver was Ann Scheiber. She was an auditor, a very shy auditor who lived in New York City. Uh, and she retired in 1944 with $5,000 in the bank. She, again, was very frugal, and she must have been a brilliant stock picker because she started playing in the market, and she turned that $5,000 into $22 million by the time she died <coughs> at the age of 101. And she left all of that to Yeshiva University so that poor girls could go to college and go to medical school. Um, Eleanor Sauerwein was kind of everybody's mom. You know, she, uh, she painted her own house, and she mowed her own lawn, and she had a vegetable garden, and really... Uh, lived very thriftily because her financial advisor uh, reported that, quote, her goal for years and years was to amass as much as she could so that it could go to the Salvation Army. It's kind of what she was living for in her later life. And when Eleanor died in 2011, she left behind $1.7 million to the Modesto, California branch of the Salvation Army. Albert Lexi was a shoe shiner. That was his business. His, and he shined shoes for about 50 years in Pittsburgh, just recently retired. And I don't know quite what the motivation was, but in 1981, he made a decision that he was going to donate all of his tips to the, the uh, free, what is it called, the, uh, the free care fund of the Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. And as that name implies, it, that's for families who have a you know, very seriously sick child and they can't afford to have treated. So he gave all of his tips for a period of years and donated uh, more than $200,000 to that, to that cause, which is about a third of his, his total earnings during those final years of his working life. Now, <coughs> sometimes I tell stories like this, and people say, oh, those are such sweet stories, Carl. But nothing large, nothing consequential, you know, nothing important is ever going to be done by those little givers. And I'm here to tell you, folks, that that is wrong. That is so wrong. That is so completely wrong. And that there's all kinds of evidence from American history. I would call this dispersed giving, right? That dispersed giving gathers together. You start off with little trickly streams, and the little trickly streams become bigger streams, and then they become a river, and then that becomes a big river. And the next thing, thing you know, you have a very, very formidable flow of funds. Uh, let me try to illustrate this to you in several ways. I was really struck <coughs> when I learned that back in 1880, the state of Ohio had only 3 million residents, okay, but it had 37 separate colleges in 1880. 
And then I checked, well, how many colleges do you think the entire nation of England had in 1880? England has 23 million people, vastly bigger, vastly older, vastly wealthier at that point. England had a grand total of four colleges. So you see that and you say, what is going on there? What's the difference? Well, basically the difference is small scale education philanthropy. Let me show you the map of Ohio colleges in 1826. I picked that year just because that was the year that um, Western Reserve University was founded. We know that today as Case Western Reserve. That's I'm probably familiar to some of you. It's a very impressive science powerhouse, among other things. I think something like 16 Nobel winners have co come out of Case Western. Lots of companies that you would know have been founded by Case Western grads. An impressive place today. Well, in 1826, it was on the backside of nowhere, all right, little dot. And it was basically willed into existence by a bunch of very low income farmers who were neighbors. And there was a feeling on the American frontier at that point that we are a democracy. We need an educated populace. Everyday people have to understand things if you're going to have a, this country work. This is very early in our, I mean, this is 50 years after our birth. So uh, these locals started to make really self sacrificial gifts to, to create a college in their midst. And there's just some beautiful stories. There's um, one farmer uh, I researched who uh, had extra wagons and horses in the winter, didn't need. So that was his contribution. He decided to start hauling stone from the local quarry to the campus all winter. It's just what he did, hauled stone. There were lots of local farm families that set aside a little portion of their egg money and their milk money. And people hear that and think, oh, my, there he's back into trivialities again. It adds up. Uh, what happened in th the case of Ohio was interesting. So this was going on in the frontier, L lots of other states in addition to Ohio, and s some churches, a bunch of churches back in the east got wind of this. And they were very impressed with what their frontier fellow citizens were doing to try to bring education to the wildlands. And so they started to try to help, to contribute to this. So they started collecting money. And folks, I'm s telling you, they were probably collecting nickels and dimes in collection plates. That's what it amounted to. But it was done over a period of years. And those churches um, uh, selected 18 different colleges that they nurtured with and collected millions of dollars over, over a 30-year period. And let me show you what the map of Ohio looked like when that campaign had been going on for about 25 years. Uh, you can see just this bloom of all kinds of colleges and uh, institutions. And you know, I only used Ohio because I had the data for this. You could play the same story probably for Michigan and Indiana and lots of, um, of our other you know, new uh, s frontier states at that point. Now I want you to jump forward in time to 2015 and get your mind around this fact. There are today 50 separate American colleges that are in the midst of a fundraising campaign that will raise them at least a billion dollars. Right? And there are probably, I don't know, 10 more that were in the middle of a billion dollar campaign a couple years ago. And there's 10 more that will be in, in starting a new billion dollar campaign in the future. Lots of colleges here depend on huge, generous gifts. And this, by the way, is not only private colleges. I was quite struck when I started looking into this and realized, you realize that like University of California, Berkeley, now gets more money from philanthropy, from private givers, than it does from its entire state appropriation in a given year. University of Virginia, same thing. They get a lot more from private givers than they do from the state of Virginia. So even our public universities are tremendously um, reliant on, upon this flow of, of, of private funds. Now, you know, when you hear, <coughs> again, you hear about someone setting aside a chunk of their milk money. I mean, I had a grandmother who had milk money, and she used to tell me how important that was to her. That was like her, that was her mad money, and that was her discretionary fund. And again, it's, it sounds laughable, I know, to modern ears. And it sounds so personal. But again, personal is really important in philanthropy. Let me try to illustrate that with a little further by telling you the story of Michael Brown. Michael Brown was a Broadway lyricist. Any of you who are in the arts know that that is your classic boom and bust business. It's like. I'm a, I'm a writer. I know about lean years. And you can be sure there were plenty of times when this guy did not have much luck. But 1956 was a good year. He had a hit musical. And so his family was flush. And he and his wife and their two boys decided they were going to share their good fortune for Christmas that year. So they invited a good family friend who was a young writer from the south, far away from home, that she could come and share Christmas with them. So. Um, at the end of their gift exchange, they, uh, they sent this young writer friend to the tree and they said, there's a little envelope there for you. Go grab it. So she opened up this envelope and there was a note in there that read exactly this. It said, you have one year off from your job to write whatever you please. Merry Christmas. And the writer's name was Harper Lee. Now, you might remember, Harper Lee was a Mississippian, right? She was a, and when she decided she wanted to be a novelist, what do novelists do? 
they go to New York City, right? So she moved to New York City like about a million people before and a million people since, and what's the first thing they learn when they get to New York City? So darn busy trying to pay the rent, no time at all for the, for the craft. This is a classic story. It's been played many times. It will be played again in the future. So she gets there. In her case, she was working in a bookstore and an airline office and was very frustrated. She just had no time or energy left over to actually devote to her art. And the Browns noticed this. All right? They paid attention. They were good human beings. And they looked and they saw that she was frustrated and that she was stuck and she needed help. And so they gave her a very generous gift so that she could retire. She did exactly what they asked. She quit those two retail jobs. She agonized over that. She didn't know whether she should accept this. But in the end, she decided she would. She quit the jobs, and she went to work. And during that gift year, she wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. And it, of course, won the, the Pulitzer Prize in 1961 and became one of the most important um, and influential American books of all time. Now, some people might wonder, is that really philanthropy? Well, I use a broad definition, but I would say, yeah. Yeah, that's, ex that's a good definition of philanthropy. That's, that's human beings seeing a need in other human beings and making sacrificial actions to, to make those needs go away. And um, much, for me at least, much of the power and the beauty of philanthropy is that it's so various. I mean, it's I really urge you not to have too narrow of a definition. If it ain't a soup kitchen, it's not philanthropy. That's really not accurate or, or, or fair. Um, there's just a tremendous range of causes that we underwrite with our millions and millions of donations every year. Let me illustrate that a little bit for you. Some of these are very unexpected. These are founding. These are the homes of, of, of some of our founding fathers. These are among our greatest cultural treasures in America. Okay, how many of you realize that all of these places and a lot more are not maintained and open to the public by the National Park Service? They are kept alive by uh, privately funded nonprofits. For instance, um, Mount Vernon, George Washington's home, of course. Mount Vernon was about to fall down. It was falling down when it was saved from ruin by a little nonprofit called the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. This was 125 years ago or something. Literally just a bunch of blue-haired ladies who said, this is a tragedy. We cannot let the father of our country's home turn into dust. So they bought it up. And I got news for you folks. They're still running it. That's still who owns Mount Vernon, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Last I knew, they have an annual budget of about 45 million bucks, and they are kicking fannies. These are tough ladies. <laughs> they are really running this place as a, as a really going enterprise. Um, Monticello, which is, of course, um, Thomas Jefferson's residence and sometimes considered his greatest creation. Monticello has been owned and run by a private nonprofit for more than 100 years and does not get a penny of public money. Um, this is uh, Montpelier, the, uh, the home of the father of our Constitution, James Madison. Same exact story, completely uh, privately funded. This is an interesting one, the last one here. Um, that is the summer cottage where Abraham Lincoln, by my math, spent about a quarter of his presidency. You've got to remember, the White House was a madhouse in Lincoln's day. And just there was no fence. You could walk right in, and people did. And he was such a softy, he couldn't say no to anybody. So he, could never get any work done, could never get any sleep. It was a, just a, a madhouse. So when he and his family needed some, either to get some work done or to get some relaxation accomplished, they would go up to this little summer cottage up in a military uh, district in the north part of the District of Columbia. And some very important things happened there. He basically wrote the Emancipation Proclamation on the back porch of this, of this, uh, of this little cottage. But this was a completely neglected part of American history. Again, nobody even remembered it until a group of private donors came along in 2008 and restored it and opened it to the public. And the same thing is true, by the way, of all kinds of other uh, historic sites. I mean, you name it, Williamsburg and Plymouth Plantation and Greenfield Village and uh, Mystic Seaport, all of those are, um, are products of philanthropy. Um, this is another area you may not realize. Private ideas and private action and private money has been really crucial to the comebacks of lots of endangered species. Um, Again, I can't get into the tale here, but it's in the book, The, the, the Timber Wolf. The, the, the recovery of the timber wolf had a huge philanthropic component to basically subsidize ranchers for their losses of wild stock, of, 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 excuse me, of livestock, so that they weren't viewing the wolf as the enemy. If, if someone would be able to compensate them, if, if the wolf ate one of their cows, all of a sudden they're willing to cooperate, and that was done by philanthropy. The, uh, the bluebird was a classic, you know, kind of grassroots philanthropy, a bunch of people just putting up houses in their backyards, uh, birdhouses in their backyards. Um, the wild turkey was actually restored. It sounds like an ox oxymoron, but it was restored by hunters. It was hunters who banded together and, and planted you know, the right habitat and so forth to make sure that they would make a huge comeback. Um, the whooping cranes, <laughs> it's just one of those amazing stories you can't imagine. I mean, it, 
private donors literally to the point of, the private donors came up with the idea of using tiny little hang glider planes to lead the cranes back down to Florida when they had to teach them how to migrate because the birds didn't know how to migrate. You have to do it once for them. Once they've done it once, they can remember, but you have to show them the first time. Again, just remarkable, risk-taking, fascinating, inventive philanthropy done to try to recover this bird that at one point was down to, I, f I think there were 22 cranes was all that was left at one point. We're up to several hundred now. Um, foreign aid, overseas assistance is another area you may not realize how important um, donors have been. This is a little schematic on some of the giving of the Gates, the Gates Foundation. Do you realize that the Gates Foundation alone, which as I'm going to tell you in just a minute here, it's just a tiny portion of our philanthropy. I know they get a lot of PR, but that's a, it's, a, it's a sliver of American philanthropy. The Gates Foundation alone, nonetheless, gives more overseas assistance to poor people in foreign lands than the entire Italian government. So get that in your brain, and then, then, then take it this next step. With that as perspective, I'm here to tell you that churches in this country give away every single year to poor people overseas about four and a half times what Gates does in a year. All right? And then, of course, there are non-church, non-religious people who are giving money for overseas. You, you pull all that together, and it's just a big philanthropic army. Here's, the, here's the, what the data totals to. In the latest year for which I got data, we actually are giving now a lot more to poor people in foreign countries privately, $39 billion in the latest year, than we do as a government, which was $31 billion in official overseas aid. So this is really grassroots action. And you know, it's, it's, it's giving to groups like Samaritan's Purse and Mercy Ships and you know, World Vision. There are probably people in this room who support those groups. And that kind of grassroots action leads me to this great word that I'm trying to single-handedly revive uh, or maybe make it up. I'm not sure it ever existed, really. But there's a beautiful word, polyarchy. All right, it kind of sounds scary at first, but it's it's much simpler than you think. Polyarchy simply refers to a society in which there are many independent sources of power. Okay, it's actually very easy to remember because it's kind of the opposite of monarchy. Right, monarchy there's one person that makes all the decisions and has all the authority and has all the resources. In polyarchy, you have a vast distribution, and the United States is a hugely polyarchic. Uh, society. And I'm here to tell you that independent philanthropy is a very big reason for that. In fact, I'd like to urge you to sort of think about philanthropy in a different way. I may, this might not have been a metaphor you've ever heard, but I think it's really accurate. You can think of those, um, you know, those, those, um, those millions of givers all around the country and those hundreds of thousands of nonprofits. Uh, you can think of those as little legislatures, little miniature legislatures is really all they are. And they do exactly what a legislature does. They look around them and they say, hmm, here in Grand Rapids, we got a problem with public parks. We need to work on that. And you know what? We also, uh, we, 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 you know, our elementary schools need better libraries. So those are two big things for us. We got to go to work on that. And then you, 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 you do whatever you do to fix a problem. You, you identify the sources of the problem. You identify fixes, and you marshal resources. That's what philanthropy does every day, and it does it on a very micro basis. Um, it's governance. It's really self governance, direct governance. Um, there's a a uh, law school professor at Yale that I admire named Stephen Carter, who he points out that those millions of individual charitable decisions lead to much more diverse spending and much better protection, by the way, of minority points of view than if you had a single government program to do that same task. So his description of philanthropy is, um, he calls it democracy in action, kind of a phrase that I like. Um, and in, in addition to being very democratic, there, another really deep strength of philanthropic assistance is that it, it allows for very individualized solutions, um, which are often, you know, there are a lot of problems, folks. You, you can't fix in, a, in an impersonal way. If, if someone has an addiction, you usually have to get your arms around them and really shake them to help them. If you're talking about, uh, you know, mentoring kids who, fall, who drop out of college, that's not something you do by writing letters or by passing laws. You have to have a mentoring relationship. You have to have a support system there that's very personal and very intimate, built on human contact. And that's something, those are things that philanthropy is very good at. Philanthropy offers individualized solutions as a, as a, uh, as a matter of course. And so, you know, the, the, some of the most successful ch charitable mechanisms, in fact, work exactly that way. I'm thinking of like, um, like Alcoholics Anonymous. Perfect example. Alcoholics Anonymous has almost no budget, but it's extremely effective at what it does. And it is effective because it has this very personal style of support. Um, micro lending circles, where you have to know and you have to trust the other person that you're pooling your money with. 
if there's any chance they're going to abscond and just disappear with the whole pool and not contribute their share next month, you're in trouble. So uh, these are the kinds of things that rely heavily on personal human accountability. And they take advantage of the fact that when you actually know someone, you can be much more effective than if it, this is just a stranger that you're dealing with. Um, Mother Teresa had a beautiful uh, phrase. She used to say, I never think about crowds. I think about individuals. And you know, if you're in government, you have to focus on the crowd. You have to think completely about the crowd. You, you are not allowed to have different approaches for different people or different rules for different places. You, it's all about equal opportunity and consistency. You have to be strictly the same for all participants. And you know, here's the problem, folks. Consistency is not really how humans work. Right? It just isn't. You know, any of those of you who are parents know that, oh, I'm so sorry. The, um, there are kids, I mean, I, my family's a perfect example. I had a son who needed big, steep guardrails around him his whole life, or he would get into big trouble fast. And I had a daughter who you could have left out in a field, and she would have grown up just fine. You know, that's the way human beings are. They just, they vary tremendously. And you don't want one size fits all. You want individually tailored uh, institutions and social structures that recognize and work with those individual differences in people. Um, so now, you know, that sometimes is something people complain about. The fact that philanthropy is so, so tailored, so individualized, so non-uniform is something people complain about. That's also something I think people, some people at least, like about government programs. They're very uniform, all right? They're very standardized. Everyone is marching in the same direction. You don't have to worry about that. But uh, again, you heard, I mean, I worked in the West Wing for three years, and no matter how careful we were, I remember just always agonizing with myself. I said, you know what, no matter how well we do this, we're going to discombobulate millions of people. That's just, that's just the way the federal government works. Is anytime there's a rule change, or there's a new tax, or there's a change in the law, you're going to just step on a bunch of people's settled expectations. Because the problem is, you can't tailor anything. You can't like turn on the faucet slowly and see what happens. Or you can't have one policy in Utah and another one in Grand Rapids. Or you can't have different rules for different people. That's not allowed. And so you have to just kind of go with this you know, lowest common denominator. And it's, uh, it's sometimes not pretty. On the other hand, philanthropy can do all of that. It, it, it is a beautiful institution for tailoring local solutions and individualized solutions. And you've got a religious version over here, and you've got a secular version there doing similar things. Um, that's uh, one of its real strengths. There was a wonderful word coined uh, to describe some of this in, I figured it out. You can, you can figure these things out. There's, there's a great program in Google that sort of figures out when words first appear in books. And the word that I'm about to tell you first appeared in 2004, and it's crowdsourcing. That, that, that was invented to kind of describe this phenomenon of, you know, how would I define? I guess I'd define crowdsourcing as lots of people taking little tiny bites out of a big problem, and you let that go on long enough, and all of a sudden the big problem isn't big anymore. And it, it kind of sounds to somebody like my 90-year-old mom, that's, that sounds like magic. That can't work, Carl. You know, tiny little people doing tiny little bites. But it does work. That's how, you know, what would be an example? That's how Wikipedia got built, right? Lots of people just did one thing in their living room, you know, but everyone kind of puts in their little bit, and you get this big result. And there's lots of examples of that uh, in the computer revolution. I think the computer revolution has, has made it much easier for us to understand this than, than, than it would have been 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, we all are surrounded. I mean, plenty of you probably remember this. That used to be a computer. That's when I first got into computers, it was these huge IBM mainframes. We very quickly learned this is a crummy way to solve problems. This is not either efficient or effective. This is efficient and effective, right? I mean, ironically, uh, but that that's the, that's the lesson of the internet is that is that uh, you know lots of little contributions aggregate together and make powerful things happen. The lesson of the hacker culture that you're looking at right here is that you know one person with a laptop can really have power and can make a difference. I don't know if there's any dentists in the audience, but it looks like one one man with a laptop can also be really good for dentistry. It looks like to me. <laughs> But um, seriously, this, I mean, this, this, this pattern, which is you know, complex problems being solved by very small actors at the local level without central direction, it sometimes sounds like voodoo to, to people who kind of have you know, really Prussian minds. But it works. We all know it works. We've all seen that it works. Uh, we've seen it not only technology, but this is something you see a lot in biology. You see a lot of this in human history of, of the, the kind of the power of these localized solutions and the decentralized governance. You've seen a tremendous amount in business today. I mean, I'm staying over in the 
what is it called? The Homewood Suites by Hilton, right? And then you got the Garden, the Garden Inn by Hilton, and then you got real Hiltons, and then you got this. There's about five different variations and personalizations and 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 niche products by the Hilton Corporation. And then of course you go to Airbnb and you get complete anarchy. That's the way business is going today: is that recognizing that people don't want the same thing. Everybody wants something a little different, and you need to recognize and tailor your product to do that. Philanthropy does that in spades. Um, so, and by the way, this is there's all kinds of examples of that. Just to give you a couple of quick ones. I think many of you know the name Goodwill Industries. It's a really marvelous philanthropy. Not only do they, uh, it's a, like a five and a half billion dollar industry at this point, and they get some really tough cases who would otherwise have a hard time getting into the job force. And they get them trained, and they get them in the habit of work, and they really do some wonderful um, job job uh, training. Goodwill is actually not one thing. Goodwill is a network of 163 local affiliates, almost all of which, by the way, are bigger than the headquarters, which is in Maryland, D.C. suburbs. The headquarters is pretty inconsequential. The headquarters just kind of connects the local affiliates and helps them operate. Each of those 163 affiliates has its own board of directors, its own fundraising, its own rules. Lots more examples like that. What would be another one? Um, Habitat for Humanity. There are 1,400 separate chapters of Habitat. Every one of them has their own board of directors, every one of them does their own fundraising and, and sets their own, their own sale. And it's an extremely effective philanthropy, I think you probably know. Um, so please, 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 folks, let's stop letting people make this argument that because philanthropy acts through a whole bunch of you know, radically independent, little, small-scale, non-uniform entities, that it's trivial or it's not effective or it's, 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 it's not powerful. That is a fundamental misunderstanding of the way problems get solved today. Um, now, I want to close by um, making sure you don't think I'm a Pollyanna who just loves everything. Uh, I want to acknowledge that philanthropists aren't all saints. You are looking at one who definitely isn't a saint. This is J. Paul Getty, who at the time he was literally the richest man in the world, installed a payphone at his estate to make his guests pay for their own telephone calls. And some of you might remember, like I do, uh, at one point his grandson got kidnapped for ransom. Anybody remember that? And the kidnappers wanted $17 million ransom to release his grandson. So Getty gets involved and he's trying to negotiate this down. That sounds a little high to me. Could you <laughs> cut that down a little bit? You know, could we cut a deal here? Anyway, at some point the kidnappers got frustrated. They cut off the poor boy's ear and mailed it to grandpa. At that point he surrenders. <clears throat> but uh, even then he wouldn't pay that full ransom. He, he apparently paid in cash as much as was tax deductible. Don't ask me why any ransom is tax deductible. I have no idea. There's got to be an economist here who can tell you that. But it was apparently. So $2.2 million he paid, but the rest he gave to his son, who was, of course, the, the father of the boy. Uh, he, the rest he gave to his son as a loan at 4% interest. So this is not you know, a warm and fuzzy man. However, I'm here to tell you that J. Paul Getty also gave the world just an absolutely sublime collection of Greek and Roman art that people are going to be coming to visit 300 years from now and looking at and being inspired and feeling like their world just got changed by what they see. And that is the beauty of philanthropy. That is the genius, really, of philanthropy, is that it can take people, not only like J. Paul Getty, it can take people like you and me. We all have a little J. Paul Getty inside of us. We are a mix of nice impulses and selfish impulses and good and bad and all kinds of motivations. And it can work with that. Philanthropy knows how to take that human nature and encourage and support, or if necessary, shame and urge us to help our fellow man. And that really is the, uh, the power and the, uh, the genius of the institution. Um, so I hope, um, if I've done nothing else this evening, I've, I've convinced you that philanthropy is just this giant, sprawling, really fascinating and powerful aspect of our culture. I've really only been able to just skim the surface. I, I, I hope you'll grab a book if you're interested. It's, it's just packed full of this kind of stuff. And as you read through it, I really urge you to keep in mind a, a, just a profound reality, which is that, uh, again, this isn't just a cute hobby. This isn't just a kind of a nice national sideline. Philanthropy is really at the very heart of our country's success and what makes America, America. So with that, I will. I will close and would be happy to take questions if you'd like. Carl, thank you so much. <laughs> we have time for a few questions. If you would, please wait and let me get to you with the microphone because we like to catch both the question and the answer. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Uh, thanks for that great history, um, really illuminating. Looking forward, it, it seems like just in the last five to 10 years, there have been a lot more serious looks uh, at the government level at curtailing some of the help. And we talked about people being passionate about things, go help them, and the government has helped through deductions and tax exemptions for a long, long time. And over the last 10 years, I've heard more and more about what seem to be pretty serious threats to that. I wonder, with your history in Washington and your knowledge of the topic, if you have a sense of what the climate is like right now, is that, does that seem like a serious threat or just a passing thing? No, it's a serious threat, and <clears throat> it is new, it's, um, and it's real. Um, you know, government is jealous. Government, like everything else touched by human beings, is jealous. It's jealous of power, it's jealous of resources, it's jealous of authority. And you literally get people, you know, I've heard senators say to me, you know, oh, this is, you know, tens of billions of dollars that we, that we give away every year. And you have to stop them right there and say, actually, you're not giving away anything. This is people's money. This is other people's money. This is, this is not money that the government owns or has control over or should have purview over. This is private resources. And, and this is, as I mentioned to you, this is self-government in action. You should be encouraging this, not discouraging this. And there are smart people who realize that. There's a guy I admire who came up with this great term. He, 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 he says that the best people in government are smart relinquishers. They know when to let go. They, they know when to not try to do something that somebody else can do better. And the, the example he uses was an industry he was actually involved in himself. He, he was one of the guys who went down to New Orleans right after Katrina and helped set up the new school system. And the main thing that they did there that was just magical was they let go. They let donors come in and set up basically a parallel system which completely replaced this horrible, corrupt, crummy public school system that had dominated in New Orleans for years and years. They relinquished power. They stepped away. And yeah, you have to set the rules and you have to make sure people are you know, fair and there's not discrimination taking place. All that can be done without becoming the operator. So there is an alternative here and there are good things happening as well, but you're quite right. There are, I mean, we, both of the presidential candidates right now are basically talking about capping or curtailing the charitable deduction as if that's like a favor they do to let you keep your own money and use it for something else. There, there is an argument that this is government money and that they're just giving it back to you to, to use it for charity. That is, that is a completely bankrupt argument. There's actually a section at the very back of the almanac where I talk about that, talk about the, uh, the kind of the legal and constitutional basis of considering uh, charitable funds to be under the control of the individual, not to be under the control of the state. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big deal right now. Um, and um, as I say, I don't think we're at a tipping point. Another thing that worries me is a huge amount of charity is done under religious auspices, okay? I don't, in fact, the numbers are quite striking. I don't know if you realize, about a third of all charity goes through religious channels. Now, it doesn't mean that's all going to churches. You know, when you send money to World Vision, that's a Christian charity that helps poor, people, poor kids in Tanzania, all right? Or if you uh, put money into a Catholic school, that's not, strictly speaking, religion. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a social project that has a, a religious sponsor. But religion is a huge motivator for giving and a huge organizer of some of the best execution of, of charity today. And, you know, I'm very concerned that, I'm starting to hear arguments I never used to hear. I'm, I'm hearing people say that, tax, that churches shouldn't be tax exempt now. You know, I'm hearing people say that, uh, we know that there's all kinds of people who say that it should be basically illegitimate for people to, to, to use religious arguments or religious justifications in the public sphere. In addition to all of the huge constitutional problems and just gigantic liberty problems that that poses, this was a country based, this was a country founded so that people could practice their religion freely, openly, without hiding it under a basket. So there's, there's problems there. But in addition to that, just as a practical matter, religious people are hugely important in social work in this country. For instance, Christians, practicing Christians adopt uh, hard to place children at about three or th four times the rate of other people. You wanna talk about who mentors prisoners who are getting out, get out of prison, who need help to kind of get a job and get set up in an apartment so they don't go back to crime? Huge amount of that is done by churches today. You know, this is a really important part of our social healing is done by religious people. So if we're in an environment where there's this open hostility to religion and, and, and kind of constant drumbeat that makes religious people feel like they need to keep their head down, it's not healthy. It's not healthy at all. So that's another aspect of this. Yeah. 
Carl, I'd like to ask a, a related, a somewhat related question to that. Have you seen any empirical evidence that the government acting in spaces crowds out charitable investment in those spaces? Yeah, no question about that. I mean, there's all kinds of examples. That little things would be Meals on Wheels. Meals on Wheels was this really wonderful, spontaneous, oh, excuse me, this spontaneous creation of, uh, of, of local people and then became a uh, kind of a, was nationalized basically by the federal government. And I think with the, surely with the best of intentions, but it just kind of lost its juice, kind of lost its energy, kind of lost a lot of its enthusiasm and, and, and the kind of the personal spirit that made it a, a, a somewhat magical program in the beginning, that it was bringing not only food to someone's door, but it was bringing camaraderie and you know, a, a personal connection. So, and there's lots of examples of that. So yeah, that's a, that's a real risk. Um, you know, you hear a lot today about people that say they want to have public-private partnerships. And that's a, that's a phrase that kind of sets off alarm bells a little bit for us at the Philanthropy Roundtable because the, the, just the, the, the raw fact is that as a matter of practice, that often means that the philanthropy gets eaten by the blob. The blob just comes in and kind of starts providing a lot of money and then it starts providing all the rules and then it says you got to take the crucifixes down from the walls in this church, in church school and next thing you know you're in a completely unexpected place. And you've lost a lot of that personal enthusiasm and intimacy and passion that really makes philanthropy magical. So um, that's a real risk and it's a fine line we have to walk. I mean no one is, I mean there's no anarchists in this auditorium. I don't think any of us want to have no government but I think all of us want to be real careful that we don't um, turn philanthropy into just kind of a, another branch of bureaucracy. That has happened in lots of places, and uh, it, it really is not producing good results. Someone else? This side can ask too. <laughs> what prompts a non-philanthropic person to become philanthropic? Mm. I'm not sure how often that happens, honestly. I think a lot of this is kind of a uh, cradle. You know, I think, uh, I mean, I, I, obviously there are many motivations, but um, we certainly see it a lot in our work that it's, they say, you know, at some point I remembered my mom or I remember what my father used to do or I remembered my, my grandma or something. There is a huge amount of kind of, uh, I, I think, tra cultural transmission that takes place here. And, and I do wonder sometimes if you don't have that original role model, you don't have that original example, can you kind of find your way into this? Clearly you can and some people do, they reason their way into it maybe, or they, they, they learn from experience or they have their heart broken in some way, they lose a loved one and the next thing you know they have a motivation. So that happens. But I think it's also quite clear that the, the kind of the, the habit, Tocqueville, we, we heard about Tocqueville in my introduction, Tocqueville said that, 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 that helping other people is a kind of a social muscle. It's something you just kind of do and it gets strong and you you do more of it, you get used to it. And uh, he, he said that that's really important to kind of keep that muscle toned. And if you lose the tone, it's, it's a lot harder to start from scratch. So I think the, uh, the cultural transmission is, is, is really important. And you have to remind yourself, folks, I, just, I don't want you to lose sight of how freakish this is. There is no other country that does this. This is not normal. In fact, this is irrational in a lot of ways. It's more rational to be selfish and greedy, and just grasp your money and hold it tight to your chest. It's really weird the way we do things. Our closest, uh, our closest kind of, the only other country that's even approaches us is Canada. We're of course kissing cousins culturally. And even Canada only gives it about 40% of, of our rate per capita. And then you hit the Brits would be next and they're at about 25% of our rate. And then it just falls off a cliff. I mean the Germans, the French, the Japanese, they don't give any money away. They don't know any of this. It's completely foreign. The, the Chinese think it's bizarre. You know, it's, there just is no tradition in other places. This is cultural. This is something that we started, it basically has a religious root. It is, it, you know, this is, this is Jewish and Christian religion uh, with a little bit of American kind of frontier ethic, uh, the kind of the barn raising, you know, spirit of cooperation that was so important in our early communities. And with a third element I would describe that kind of is a big part of it, making it distinctive America is the entrepreneurial aspect. Um, this, who knows where it comes from, but it's now rooted, is this notion that if you make a big pile of money from nothing in this country, you, you eventually get into philanthropy. It's just almost expected. You know, Rockefeller did it, Carnegie did it, Car Carnegie did it. Now in those days, they did it at the end of their life, after they were done working, as a, that was an old man's game. That's not the case anymore. Now Zuckerberg does it when he's 30, all right? 
So that is the, maybe one of the encouraging trends, is that there is this clear impulse among the entrepreneurial crowd that this is kind of a, one, part of your responsibility as a good citizen. After you've had a very successful business, then you start helping other people succeed. So that's great. Um, but um, that's only, as I say, one of the three strands that I would identify as crucial. You know, the religious strand and the, uh, the kind of the frontier, you know, kind of neighborly community strand, and then the entrepreneurial strand. And two of the three of those are kind of in decline. And, and the entrepreneurship is kind of in, I'd say, holding its own, but not exactly uh, booming, certainly not among millennials today, alas. So we'll see. We'll see. One more. You've illustrated how charitable our country is, yet the statistics that I've heard, unverified, are that Christians on average give 2.5% of income, and others in our country give about 1% of income. Have you confirmed that at all? Yep, you're, you're in about the right range. I mean, it's, it's a little hard to, you know, even the definition of what a Christian is is obviously tricky, but you're, that's, the, that's the right range. It's sort of between 1 and 3%, our national average is around 2% and has been for about 50 years. Now, again, that's a lot higher than any other country, and 2% is not trivial. I mean, I showed you that GDP, I mean, you know, 5% of GDP is the entire national defense business today. That's a lot of money, so it's, it's not trivial, but you're right. I think your implicit point is one that I would underline, which is that we can do more. We can do a lot more. And plenty of us would like to see us do a lot more. Um, you know, if, if in my parents' generation, in the, 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 the 40s and 50s, they were giving 2%, we should be able to do more than 2% today. Disposable income is up, discretionary income is up. I mean, I grew up, I was one of five children. We had one bathroom in the house. Looking back, you'd probably have a child abuse case today if you tried to <laughs> raise kids with that. That was normal. Everyone had one bathroom with you know, no basement. I mean, that was, that, was, that was the standard of living. The standard of living is not that today. I, I'm quite sure that we as a society could find room for more than 2% of our income on average. And there are people who do. Um, I mean, there's, I, I should have showed you, there's some really just amazing data on where the most generous parts of the country are. It's not at all what you expect. It's not New York City. It's not San Francisco, believe me. It's basically the Bible Belt and Mormon America. Those are the places that really give big time uh, as a percentage. So um, we could do more, and plenty of people do do more, but it's all about, first of all, understanding how consequential it is when you do do more. That's one of the reasons I'm giving these talks and wearing my voice out is because I, I really think if people understood this, they would feel better about giving. And, um, and you know, just kind of really uh, understanding that you're part of something really productive and beautiful, I think, would motivate some people. If the government takes away the charitable deduction, what's the role of the church? Interesting. Uh, that's, of course, a huge guess, but there have been a lot of people thinking about that. Um, we know that it would knock down giving, that it would have an effect on giving, and that it would vary radically by sector. Listen, most of the people are still going to give to their church, whether they can deduct it or not. That's done for other than rational reasons, for other than economic reasons. That's not going to go away. But the giving to art museums? Best guesses are about half of that would evaporate if you, if you eliminate or, or sharply curtail the deduction. And, you know, education would be somewhere in between, I would have to guess. So there's no question it would be done. Now, the good news is we are a generous people who give for other than self-interested reasons. And a lot of us would continue to give even if it wasn't. But, you know, there's only so much blood in the turnip. You can't just squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. If you're giving more in taxes, that's less that you feel able to give to other purposes. And lots of us would rather have people feel like to the extent they have money that they can play with, that's mad money that they can direct as they choose, we'd like them to direct it directly rather than to write it a check to somebody impersonal in a distant location who is going to apportion it uh, in a very bureaucratic way. So uh, I can't give you a specific answer, but we know it would, uh, it would hurt. Carl, thank you. Thank you for tonight. My pleasure. pleasure.